Welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown, the podcast where we watch scary movies so you don't have to. From award-winning to completely unknown, we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Solange Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously as we take these movies seriously. Before we talk about this movie, I want to issue a very clear content warning. There's a lot of discussion of death by suicide and mental illness in a way that may or may not be helpful to you if you were in a difficult place. In fact, the reason I'm making the content warning is that I feel it may be detrimental to you if you are in a bad place right now. So just be careful about listening to this episode. It is 2023 and our podcast just keeps rolling along like the year didn't even change. Like it didn't even change. Like it's actually 2022 right now. Like it might still not even be Christmas yet, and here we are recording. We're going to pretend we're in the future, though. In the future, we're going to talk about the movie Smile from 2022. Ugh, so long ago. Yeah, back in 2022. Way back. It's practically a period piece. That was that year when... (laughs) I don't know what happened, but I know it's one people complained about. Yeah, it's part of the blob of years. Yeah. But not 2023. That's going to be totally different. Oh, 2023 has been amazing so far, listeners. <laughs> yeah, Nothing not one but thing good has news. gone wrong yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool. And that's why we smile. Smile. Uh, this was not the movie I expected. Me neither. Is that an advertising flaw? Like, did they market this movie incorrectly? Or did I just not pay attention to what they were telling me this movie was going to be? I don't know. My impression, let's see how this catches, was that it would be one of those teenager movies like Truth or Dare or something like that, where a bunch of teenagers get into some occult thing they shouldn't, and now... I don't know, they're dying one by one with big smiles on their faces, and when you see the smiley person come for you, it's bad. Yes. And it wasn't super far off from that. It was just like if that happened in like the ring instead of anything else. This was definitely one of those infectious demon kind of movies. Yeah, this was very related to the ring. They even made a point that they're like, oh, the deaths occur within seven days. That yes. That's the most... It wasn't exactly seven days, but yeah. Yes. And it had a lot of the like elongated limbs and broken body shapes and dark shadowy rooms and jump scares that come from movies like The Ring or like yeah. like Japanese or Korean horror films. Yeah, it, it's almost like a remake of The Ring. But then when I was thinking that during the movie, I was like, well, really, The Ring goes like into the whole lore of the character the demon and how that goes and this is very different yeah this didn't care at all like we have no (laughs) idea where it came from how it started how it's defeated nothing like there was no beginning and no end to this demon story it was just this is a thing that's happening it's been happening forever it will continue to happen forever please be aware even though the year has changed to 2023 now (laughs) nothing is gonna stop no No, it's just going to keep going. Okay, my thought on seeing the trailer, I don't know if I saw much of the trailer, but, you know, getting the gist of what this movie was, I thought, like, maybe people would smile real big and, like, their heads would split or something. And But the smiling was like nothing. It was just, they just happened to smile at you as they were dying by suicide or murdering someone, whatever. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Like, yeah, I like you, I, I thought it would be different, and I don't really get why it was happening the way it was. But again, they didn't explain the demon at all. Like, <laughs> why is the demon making them smile? I don't know. Now, there were a lot of very interesting things around smiling, particularly in social situations, and particularly by people who are fighting with depression or anxiety or other like mental illness kinds of things the whole 
society forces you to smile when you don't feel like smiling message was really like, I really liked that. And Mm -hmm. I liked how like at the birthday party, she's at her nephew's birthday party. And like, there's a whole thing where it goes into slow motion while they're singing happy birthday. Yeah. And she's having what look like very slow, dramatic changes. But what if the world had been moving at the right pace would have been like micro expressions of, you know, between smiling and not smiling. And Mm -hmm. like, she's clearly battling some emotional state, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then what they did with the song, like the happy birthday song just kind of gets stuck and starts droning on. And I thought that was one of her hallucinations at first, but she just kept going on with the song. So it was just for us to enjoy. Yes. And I think for us to see that she had her like, resting sad face yeah but then she was like trying to force herself you know she was having those moments of like i'm at a birthday party this is for a seven-year-old like i need to pretend to be happy i'm gonna bring everybody down but that can only you can only maintain that for so long and then like it was i found that really interesting my first thought as soon as this movie started like the first couple scenes I would notice every time someone smiled, like just a little bit, you know, just like greeting someone or whatever, they just smiled a bit. And I just immediately thought every time I'm like, I bet production had a meeting about this smile and, you know, whether they should be doing it or how much they should smile. (laughs) Were there even that many people who were smiling in this movie? Not a lot. There were not a lot of like not demon smiles. Like this was not a perky movie. No, there weren't big smiles, but just you know yeah. the little smiles that we do all the time as a social contract yeah yeah one of the things i struggled with though was that these people were not following my understanding of social contracts in in <laughs> like everyone was so aggressive with her as she was descending into madness from like their perception like yeah. they literally thought she was having a breakdown and everyone was and being so helping. just fix yourself yeah and i didn't understand any of those reactions like her her fiance was just like nah i'm not interested in having anything to do with any of this like yeah. i'm out basically his whole thing that she kind of threw in his face i think there I think he had one line about it and then she threw it in his face that he has a plan in life and this is messing it up and that's no good. Like it was definitely that he was only along for the ride as long as things were good. He was not richer or poorer. Right. But that wasn't the character that he was playing. Like he seemed supportive initially. Right. I got that. But he was there was nothing else about him other than the movie telling us these things that made me think, oh, this guy's not really interested in, like, anything. He walks in on her. She's broken a glass. Well, you know, there's all this stuff. He's immediately super caring and helpful. Mm-hmm. That's not how someone who's not interested in solving problems with you would would act. Yeah. I don't know. It was like he could have, even if it had just been like, oh, well, don't forget to clean that glass up as he went yeah, and like changed out good. of his work clothes or something. But he was all over being this really amazing guy until suddenly he wasn't, and it was too abrupt. I was disappointed that him and the doctor in charge of the hospital where she worked and all of those different guys, none of them ever said, oh, you should smile more or anything like that. I was waiting I for I guess that. the movie wasn't going that direction. I was definitely <laughs> waiting for that. But, I mean, that is a part of it because that is part of the whole thing. You know, women in particular are expected to not express any negative emotions where they might make someone else feel bad. They're supposed to hide all that stuff and, you know, just keep trucking along. And I feel like it would have been appropriate for at least someone, even a stranger, like at a gas station or something to just be like, Oh, you'd be so pretty if you smiled. And yeah, you know, and then, the then she would have murdered him, him and <laughs> would have solved her problem right there. Yeah. So, you mentioned her boss, and I felt like he he was a little more consistent in that he sort of like he was the company man, like he wanted to help people feel better, but he also wanted to balance the budget and yeah. he was going to balance the budget over helping people feel better. And that's kind of how he approached everything with her too, where there was like, he wanted to be her friend, but he was also her boss and he was also a professional in the mental health business. And so when she started acting weird, he like 
jumped on protocol. Yeah. The person I thought was inconsistent was her sister. Her sister was terrible. Except that there were points where she wasn't. Uh, that's like kind of realistic, up, though. I mean, I guess. I don't know. I didn't feel like I could tell what how the sister was going to react to things because I didn't really understand. Like, at first, she was caricature-like in her, yes. in her entitlement. So you didn't expect your head to fall off at any point? <laughs> no, I didn't realize her neck was made of Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a weird moment. That was a weird <laughs> moment. I mean, it, to be fair, it was a hallucination. Yeah. No, I just, I didn't expect her to have moments of humanity later because they made her such a cartoon character of of the like soccer mom that her yeah that rose accused her of being but then it she really wasn't or at least you know there was reality and we got that moment that that conversation about how she had taken so much of the stuff that her mom had done to them and she Which had is to why get out she's terrible now right and that she just wanted to move on from it like all of that explained her, and I was like, oh, okay, like, I get you now. And to dive into that. Yes. Okay, I don't think I'm digging too deep into any layers here when I say this is a movie about cycles of trauma and how coming from trauma traumatizes you, and you then pass that on to people you're dealing with, and it just follows along, and it don't get better. Well, so that's the thing, is... Yeah, that felt like the message of the movie. Yeah. Which maybe because it's a horror movie, they were like, oh, we have to, you know, the horror of it is that it never gets better. Yeah. But I I don't know. I guess I prefer my horror movies to show the horror, but then be like, there is a way to get out of it. And maybe this character chooses not to use that way. Yeah. But Whoa. that it's not hopeless that there's choices yeah. and that maybe, you know, we can always end in a bad note because the character chose the bad path. <laughs> But there was a good path to have chosen. Well, that's what's interesting is that the good path, I mean, they explained how to beat the monster. They may have been wrong. I don't know. But she, if she had died with no one around, then no one would be traumatized by her death. And therefore, the monster would be gone. And she tried and she failed, which makes this one of those movies where it's like kind of pointless because you start with the monster in play. At the end, the monster's just in play again, and right. it'll be hitting some other people. Okay, I would like to discuss the fact that, yes, it did suggest that, but if you die by suicide while no one is around, people are still traumatized by your death. It's true. Like, it doesn't have to be in someone's face for it to happen. And I think maybe that was just some, like, metaphor, allegory. Like, yeah, you know, definitely. They weren't saying that, but it did kind of suggest that. And... Like you said, nothing changed, which to me, there was a moment where she was like, she talked about how she was a child and yes, she regretted the decision she made as a child, but she was also a child and not equipped to handle what she was, the situation she was put in. She forgave herself, basically. She kind of forgave her mom a little bit, maybe, or maybe. at least was moving past that and like had taken control of her brain, basically. And that's the note that I put. That I was, was like, oh, yeah. the power of being able to like take control back in your own mind. Which that could have been. Was the fantastic. Big victory. Absolutely. And then they completely took all of that away because all of that was imaginary. And the demon was like, haha, just kidding. Nope. Yeah. And here's a guy that you love that you have to die in front of so that this cycle continues and you know you're doing this to him. And like, it was just so dark. Yeah. I enjoyed the part where it was like, this is all in your mind. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. not real. It is mental illness but it's real in your head but that means you can take control of it because it's in your head and that that was some good you know matrix stuff happening there except then it says just kidding you can't actually take control yeah, of it. it your brain it runs beats you. you and i don't know that's that is very disappointing it reminded me of how i felt at the end of split because at the end of that movie i was like "Ooh, i don't know that this movie has done a service to the benefit of people with identity disorders. Yeah. And like that one, this movie 
ends in a place that I have concerns will provide misinformation for people who don't understand what it's like to have mental illness and make people who do have mental illness feel hopeless about their situation. Like, I don't know yeah. that it's benefiting anyone <laughs> to yeah. have this story told. I and mean, they, they want it to be scary. Well, but, and in fact, is quite detrimental. Like, I would mm -hmm. be very careful about recommending this movie to certain people. Yeah, there's a lot in this movie where the <laughs> her therapist is terrible. Terrible! <laughs> Just terrible. <laughs> And basically is like, doesn't want to fix her. Not only did the therapist not use effective tools that were beneficial to her, but she was actively doing things that were harmful. Like yeah. talking about her behind her back with her fiance and letting her find mm -hmm. out about it. And like, there were just so many things where Ambushing she violated. Ambushing her, her house. Yes, where she violated the trust of her patient so egregiously. Like the part where she smiled real big and stomped at her down the stairs. Well, she was hallucinating that. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but yes, like that. Scary. This, to me, felt like a movie written by someone who was struggling with mental illness, who had not had a lot of good support around that struggle, and had, in fact, been betrayed by people who they thought would support them. And then they are writing this all into a horror movie and like yeah. just venting, like just bleeding out all of their frustration and hopelessness into this movie, which in that case, it may have been beneficial to them to be able to uh, express this in a sense. creative way. But then I don't know about anyone else partaking in this. And I don't remember if that therapist did it, but so many people in this movie, including our main character, Rose, who is... Some sort of therapist. She's she's like a counselor at a yeah. at a in some kind of mental health hospital. Yeah, they used the word crazy to refer to her so much, like dozens of times. I noted that too. I was like, oh, people are using the word crazy detrimentally, like inappropriately, quite often. Yeah, and I think that was very intentional. And that, I, I think that did do what the author or the writer or producer or whoever, you know, was trying to accomplish in pointing out how inappropriate that is. Well, she shouldn't have been doing it herself then. <laughs> and, okay, here's the thing about the cycles of trauma, though. Yes. So, at one point, she inadvertently traumatizes the seven-year-old boy whose birthday party it is by giving him a dead cat as a present, which is cool. You know, but some people don't like that. Some people don't no. want that. And he didn't. No, he wasn't wasn't a fan. So that happened and, you know, he freaked out. But then later, she's outside getting into her car after arguing with her sister. And he's looking out the window at her and seeing how weird things are. And that's, you can see that even though it's not a bloody murder in front of his face, but you can see that he's carrying on he's infected trauma. With the trauma. And they don't make a point of that. They don't have the smile monster come after him, but mm -hmm. it's there. It's happening. It's being carried on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, the point of the movie is keep your nonsense to yourself and don't bug everybody. Only that's going to be impossible because the demons in your brain are going to force you to inflict gonna crawl yourself into your mouth. on everyone. Yeah. It's just so, oh, it's so hard. And there's so much potential for showing how what could have been done or how, you mm -hmm. know, someone could have helped. And like, I don't know, I guess, yeah, I really struggled with this movie. And I'm actually really glad that I didn't watch it when I was in like a really dark place myself, because given how much it impacted me now, where I feel really good, I, I'm concerned at how I would have felt had I watched it at a different time. Yeah. That being said, I thought there were great things about this movie as a movie. Like I really, I thought it was interesting. Uh, some of the things that they did with the camera work and like mm -hmm. different angles and like using the camera to really illustrate how off center she felt. Yeah. And how the world felt upside down, you know, all of that. Some of it was even a little on the nose. Yeah. But, you know, I thought it was really, it was interesting. It was creative. 
there were even sound effects. Like there were some very, there were a, a bunch of different, very like short, sharp sounds that yeah. were used for various things that did a thing. Like they, they were helpful. Yeah. They were like the wrong sound because they were too loud for what they were. Yes. But it was making the point of like yeah. things. I thought there were times where it like just fuzzed out all the sound. Like you could tell she, she wasn't connecting with the world in any way. Yeah. And then there would be something really dramatic and it would take something really dramatic to like snap her focus back in place. Like she'd almost get hit by a car and that would be like, Oh right. I exist in the world. Yeah. And I thought some of that was really like a strong portrayal of what it feels like to be in those places. Yeah. I felt like the, I don't know, the overall structure of her breakdown through the course of the movie was well done and interesting it's just that it, you know, it, it left you hanging with failure at the end. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, it didn't it didn't really resolve the monster thing. But as a mental illness thing, it was good. Mm-hmm. And except for the fact that we get proof of sorts, which could all still be hallucinations, that this cycle of suicide, monster smiles goes back like 20 plus people except for that little piece of evidence, it could all entirely be in her head. It could be that she's traumatized by this one woman who died in front of her, and it's messing her up really badly. I guess. Because, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure that the movie explored that, like, or, or considered that as an option, really. Like, I think the movie was presenting, like, there is a demon here. Well, but it is... It's all consistent with that being the case, other than the fact that we saw, you know, her cop friend find this line of reasoning because everything that happens is in her head, really. So that was kind of cool to have that possibility. And again, it makes it all about the cycles of trauma. Mm -hmm. So what did you think about the fact that when they did give her an option on how to avoid dying, it was... Well, you don't have to die. You could just kill someone else. But only if you do it really violently. (laughs) And in front of someone else so that the trauma gets passed on. Like, what did you think of that whole, like, little bubble of possibility? I mean, it was weird. It makes sense. You know, it fit in with how the system worked. Of course, she couldn't take that option because she's our hero. So she wouldn't do that. But they really rode the line that maybe she was going to do that. Yeah, they did. Culminating in the scene that was very weird to me, where she's stabbing Carl, the The, patient at her hospital, to death over and over. He seems to be enjoying it. He's just freaking out, but not actually appearing to be in pain. And her boss is over there tearing his own face off. Yeah. While it happens. And it's like, why is all of this stuff happening? This is nuts. But then later in the movie, when the monster tears its face off, I can kind of see how maybe if she hadn't broken out of that, her boss would have torn his face off and crawled into her mouth. Which is a weird thing to say, but it would have made sense in the context of the movie. (laughs) I guess. I don't know. That was my other question, though, was like, what was happening? Like, what did that mean at the end when the giant skinless monster crawled into her mouth? Well, the demon was already in her head. It was, but it had to... It's like in Dreamcatcher, where we're talking about the world inside people's heads, where the monster's in her head. It's spending these whole four to seven days, you know, wheedling its way in tighter and gaining more control, but it has to actually defeat her conscious will in order to actually be in charge and that is the final thing is that it goes inside the dream self of Mm. her and now it's controlling her and it had to take its skin off because it's gonna wear her skin yes i thought that was pretty cool actually did you notice that the demon had rows and rows of mouths like it made me think like there were layers of human in there it was like a matryoshka doll of (laughs) of depression monster oh yeah because you know why trauma monster when it gets into her it didn't just take her skin it goes inside her body so that's one more layer it's just a whole lot of teeth yeah that was creepy that was that was horrific like (laughs) it was not great 
No. You said it, the, the whole, like, you could murder someone instead thing fits how t- the trauma works in the movie. And I guess in the movie, maybe, but it doesn't fit how trauma works in real life. Like, you can't murder someone in front of someone else and be like, now I'm okay, and it's all in you. True. Like, that, your trauma yeah. doesn't go away well, when you commit murder. Yeah, they're only keeping half of the story there, that that it does get passed on to them. They they suffer, too. Right. But, yeah, it doesn't fix you any. No. And Although the guy who did it, he wasn't fixed. No. They said he was fine, but he was not fine. No, that's true. It felt like the metaphor got away a little bit. Or, you know, kind of got out of control. Like, yeah. it started like, oh, this works. And then, you know, they carried it a little too far and it just got too messy. And they were trying yeah. to contain too much. Trauma is huge. And they were trying to contain too much of it in this one storyline, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that that's definitely what they were trying to do. They wanted to tell a story about trauma. And there's limitations when you're making up a monster, too. So Yes, yes. I mean, really, it was it was a good movie unless you start digging into it like we do and like taking it too seriously. Take it too seriously, and then you're like, oh, this doesn't really work. Ratings. I was looking forward to our conversation so that I would know how to rate this movie. And did I'm, it help? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it helped but I don't know what, I, what I've what i arrived at. So let's say that this was a very polished, well-done movie with, the, like you said, a lot of cinematographic effects that were interesting. And I did kind of get into the the premise of it, like the whole cycles of trauma thing was, I could see where it was going. And I actually, I liked when the monster crawled into her at the end, except that, she should have won at the end because that mm-hmm. just was a waste of time. So really the ending is kind of the big letdown for me. And I know that's a classic horror thing where the good guys are gone and all, but it, it just makes it feel like it was a waste of time. So overall, I award this three and a half kerosene lanterns out of five. It was kind of enjoyable, but I do think you need to be on the lookout if you're at all in a dark space yourself. Yeah. One of the really good things that I didn't mention earlier was use of color because, and I I don't know if I would have noticed this as much if we hadn't been watching episodes of the new series Wednesday about Wednesday Adams, but I noticed that Rose is wearing all like gray and brown and dark blue and like really muted depressed colors and then her sister who has spent her entire life trying to pretend that the stuff that happened to them as kids never happened is wearing like bubblegum pink yeah always and That's like a good one to good see them standing next to each other was like the color illustration of how they are handling their childhood traumas which i thought was interesting so there were lots of those little things. I think it was there was skill in this. And for me, it didn't quite hit right. And, you know, maybe part of it is that I suspect that if someone who knew things about plotting would say this movie did not follow a traditional American plot lines and didn't follow, you know, the three act or five act thing that we're used to, it had a much more Asian plotline feel. And and that whole beginning and ending in sort of the same place and just exploring what happens to someone in that in that place, I think kind of comes from, you know, that other culture flavor of storytelling. Yeah. Sometimes I like that and in this case I did not like it. And I think it really, really comes from the fact that it left a very uncomfortable taste in my mouth just in in the message that that people will take away from it after watching given how things unfolded. So, I am going to give this movie 3 kerosene lanterns out of 5 with the full understanding that there are probably other people who would give this a much higher rating because they would appreciate the darkness more for what it is. Mm-hmm. I find this movie kind of dangerously dark as opposed to entertainingly dark. Yeah, that's understandable. And like Bambi, I might enjoy watching this movie again, but I would end it sooner than it ends. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. When when we got that good ending before the end, I was like, that seemed too easy. Yeah. But that is that's what I wanted to happen. Which I mean, to be fair, is again, there's this skill there. Like mm-hmm. that's that's creative storytelling to take a a viewer's expectations and be like, mm mm. No, no, no. You don't get the comfortable thing. I mean, that's what horror is. Yeah. But also it made me too uncomfortable and I didn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it just made it like, like, I'm okay with it being like a dark ending. I just want, I don't know, like I wanted it to have a resolution. Like that's literally a lack of resolution. Her story is resolved right now, but the story of this monster, which we still know nothing about, is just ongoing and totally right. unchanged by this whole series of events. Right. And in that, if that's your measure, there was no arc whatsoever in mm-hmm. this movie. And, you know, I think that's the point of those multicultural storytelling is that that's a measure that we use in our culture almost exclusively. Yeah. Problem, solution. <laughs> and... That's not that's not how everybody tells stories worldwide. True. So. Fight the horror of a world gone mad. So now that we've started a new year and we're past the holidays, it is time for us to get back to having hot political tips at the end of these episodes. This episode, I'm going to keep it kind of short because the political tip was super obvious to me from the <laughs> beginning. This movie is about mental health. And my hot political tip is that you should be advocating for mental health funding, mental health services, straight up acceptance of mental health as a thing, because we're still fighting that battle. And hold your elected officials accountable, because politicians sure like to use mental health as an excuse for every problem that they have failed to solve. Yeah. But then when it comes, much like the boss... In this movie, when it comes right down to it, they balance the budget instead of providing mental health services that are so desperately needed. So advocate for those things, read up on them, and talk to your elected officials about how you expect them to prioritize mental health in your community. All right. That sounds good to me. So we'll be back next week with another movie. And surely 2023 will still be very kind and gentle with us. Just smile. It's going to be great. (laughs) Bye, everybody. See you next week. Don't forget to call your elected representative. Uh. (laughs) (laughs) It was my arm. Was it? It was my arm. I didn't make a fart.